know how I would sit through half an hour. I didn't know how they would sit through half an hour. Um, and it was, it was pretty frightening. And I think I still am frightened at some points today, but I also love it. And uh, to be able to be responsible in that way for someone is absolutely a gift, I think. So I would like to just start first by, uh, I'm assuming everyone has the handout, so I'm gonna go through each uh, bullet point that I have on this handout. Um, and the first one is the introduction. So approaching the young beginner. We approach with this sense of this blank canvas, right? And I find that there has to be a point where you establish not only that you're in charge, but that you're also with them and that you're together and learning together from each other. I always find that I learn a lot from each student and I change my vocabulary as I learn. You know, there are interesting things that happen. So I like to be friendly, but I like to be firm. And of course, you know, approaching the parents of the young beginner is a completely different lecture, which I've also done, but I'm not gonna get into too much detail with that, but I will talk a little bit about what I expect the parents' role to be uh, as we go through the lecture. So the beginner shows up. It really depends how old they are it, according to how their maturity level is and their level of understanding. I've taught beginners as young as three. I've also suggested that some children come back when they're a little older. I have learned just through my own experience that there isn't too much advantage of starting them too young if they're not ready to receive the information. I think that anywhere between three and seven years old is considered a beginner for me. Very rarely start three-year-olds. Um, usually the age is five or six. And I think once they've started to socialize and can do preliminary things and are ready to receive information, that's a good time to start. Um, so we start with the physical essentials. After I've pretended that I'm their friend in the first meeting, and I have a nice smile and they're most of the time they buy it, sometimes they don't. But I say, okay, this is the piano. You have to introduce them to this huge thing that they're about to undertake, which is playing this big instrument. Um, the good thing about piano, I find, is that it's much easier from the very beginning to sound somewhat decent. I mean, you give somebody a violin, they really don't sound very good for a very, very long time. And it can upset the household, it can do a lot of things. So I find that we're lucky as piano teachers that at least we can make a pleasant sound on this instrument from the very beginning. And um, I like to get into the piano literally uh, in the first lesson. So I kind of introduce them to the bench, the keyboard, we talk about the white keys, the black keys, and then immediately I engage them with sound. So I'll put the pedal down and just have them standing next to me and I'll say, listen to this. And listen to this, then listen to this, and I assign a name, like that could be thunder, that could be birds, that could be just a talking, you and me talking together. How do they differentiate sound quality right away? So the very, very first thing is to teach the ear, even before we've had the sitting position or the hand position. And ear is part of the physical essentials. The other thing I love to do, if you have a grand piano, it's a little bit easier. If you don't, you could still do it. You just might have to have really long arms. Um, I like to put the pedal down, and it's a little bit difficult to show here, but you can get a sense of what I'm doing. I'm standing up, my damper pedal is down, and I start striking the strings like this with the pedal down because I want them to understand that the piano is a stringed instrument. We, I know it's a percussion instrument. Yes, it is. The hammers hit the key and not our fingers. But the sound of the string, the vibration of the string, is a very, very important and crucial part in introducing musical sound because we don't want to associate a mechanical action with a non-mechanical sound, right? 
So the string vibrates, but we don't hold the note and vibrate on it. So we have to make the student understand that they are actually playing the string right from the very beginning. And I think then you let them do it, and they usually love to do that. It also will help a shy student open up a little more. If they can do something fun that they can touch, and immediately sounds good. Um, the next thing is, of course, the seating position. Now, you know, many people, all that, everything that I'm going to say today, I'm sure some people somewhere have heard, or they've heard a version of it, or they even have their own way of doing it. One of the nice things about these uh, lectures is that I also end up learning new things every time. I've had teachers share things that I never would have thought of and that are wonderful. So I encourage all of you, if you have something to share that you know we haven't covered or you do it a different way, I'd love to know about that um, at, the, at the end of it. So <clears throat> we have the seating position, which I always like to make sure that the lower back is not slouching, that we have this idea, this support of the lower lumbar and that the shoulders are down. I make them actually let their hands and arms hang very loosely before I even try to put them on the key. And I try to identify, you know, where these students are gonna be sitting. At home, some of them sit on an upright piano, some have benches that don't adjust. So you wanna try and find a height that's very appropriate for the size of the students, okay? So the ideal height with the back straight and shoulders down is that the elbow will be slightly, slightly at level or a little higher than the keyboard. You don't want the elbow down here because not only does that uh, prevent them from being loose, but it also makes them slouch. So you're gonna have some problems with shoulder tension, slouching, and looseness if the elbow is too low. So we want to find something. If that involves a couple of books, so be it. If it involves, you know, rotating a bench to a certain height, that's ideal. But like I say, not everybody has that. So we find the right seating position. Then, almost everybody probably knows we put something round in the hand. Why are we doing that, right? Imagine you're holding a ball. Imagine you're holding an orange, whatever. Anything you want, but what we want is we want to have, not that the, we're holding something, but that when we turn the hand over, that the bridge is going to be at a curve. So it's very, very difficult to correct that in an older student. So if a student has a collapsed bridge, very difficult to make them understand that that's what's necessary. So. I use a pencil and I take the tip of the pencil. If I like the student, I use the eraser. If I don't like the student, I use the sharp end. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, kidding. Not really, but no. As I to do that, and I make sure that I put the pencil right underneath the third finger so that when the hand can hang off the top of the pencil, that it's a natural bridge, right? So that's the first thing. And then with that pencil, you can have them hold it or you can hold it for them. Sometimes the parents want to hold it, not a good idea. Um, put it there and kind of just vibrate it and let, let them see what it looks like to let the bridge fall and let the bridge be supported with the pencil. Okay. And that's, I find, an invaluable way to make sure that we have the right position of the hand because if this is correct, then you don't need to tell them to curve their fingers. Their fingers will naturally curve because there'll be an angle toward the keyboard. That's ideal. Now, that is harder than it looks. <laughs> Requires patience, so I actually make that a general part of their practice. I make them do that every day at home. They can bring their own pencil, whatever device they like to use, and they have to show me these things. This is like showing me a piece. They have to show me this. And I time them and I say, can you get seated properly? Can you have your hand properly on the keyboard? How many seconds? And when it gets down to about five seconds, I give them an A plus and they're done. But it's good to time them because it makes them excited about doing better the next time. 
So <clears throat> after we've identified the shape of the hand and the fingers, we have to immediately understand the different joints we use as pianists and where we could have possible ten tension in these places. So I like to have numbers for the different joints on the piano. So I've got joint number one is the very first bend after the tip of your finger, okay? So that's joint number one. Joint number two is here at the knuckle, excuse me, in the middle of the finger. That's joint two. Joint three would be the knuckle or where the bridge is underneath the knuckles. Joint four is your wrist, one of the most important joints. They're all important, but boy, is four ever important. And then five is the elbow. Six is the shoulder, the shoulder joint. And seven is presumably this arch supported back. So the lower back and middle back supported without the rounding. And as you watch, you identify each joint. You say this is number one, two, three, four. And you check and see if they're loose just by physically, you know, rotating a little bit, asking the student to show you, can you move joint number four independently? Can you move just your wrist? Can you move just your elbow? Can you keep your shoulder rotated without going up? Can you just feel that? Is this nice and supported? Is joint number one curved or is it flat? You know, usually if two and three are slightly curved and properly positioned with the pencil, joint number one is taken care of. So we always want to make sure that we have that. Those places are often when I have transfer students or I haven't taught this to beginning students and I try to go through it with them at an older age, often they're not aware. They're not aware where they're tense, but they do feel tense. So this is very important to make sure that these things are loose, flexible, and identifiable by the student and that they are aware from the beginning, okay? So then we go for exercises to develop each one of these joints. Some, I like to start with the big joints first because fine joint control happens after a while. It doesn't happen at the first lesson. It's very hard to, oh, okay, I gotta curb my fingers, I gotta play now, I gotta do this. Too much to think about. One motion that they're very used to is like clapping or hugging or using their entire arm. So at this point, I use gravity drops with a full arm. What that means goes the principle, it's very uh, simple there with the word gravity, allowing the natural weight of the arm to drop into the key. Okay. So if they're tall enough to reach the pedal, I put the right pedal down, the damper pedal, and I hold it down. Or I'll hold it down for them if they're too tiny and they don't have a pedal extender, you know but it's important that the pedal is down for this exercise. And after we've identified finger one, two, three, four, five, I say, let's take finger three because it's the longest finger, it's right in the middle of your hand, and it's the easiest finger to control the drop of the hand. And I show them where the C is, you know, next to the two black keys, right? Then we find all the Cs. And with the pedal down, I ask them, pick up your hand, drop with the third finger with a full circular motion and I say it's like a gong or a bell and the pedal down is crucial because I don't want them to hear when they touch the note I want them to hear the vibration of the sound after it's been touched because that's how we listen as musicians we listen to the relationship of one sound to another. And it's important to develop that skill in the ear right away. So once they can do that, they say, okay, it's my turn, I get to do it now. Now, whether they're putting it down or I'm putting it down for the pedal, they'll start, they usually get the first one right, and then they might miss, you know, oops, I didn't hit the right note. I let them do it. I let them make the mistake. Don't try to correct and say, well, that's not C, because their first touches 
should be freedom, should be confidence, and should be listening and not correcting, not saying, oh, you hit the wrong note or something. You know, it should be positive. So I don't care what they hit, you know, frankly. They could hit anything, a cluster, as long as they're listening and as long as they're understanding that it's free. Because if they miss and you say, oh no, hit just this note, you know what's gonna happen? They'll get tight. They'll get tight here, they'll get tight there, they'll be scared, and they're not gonna approach the piano that way with freedom, which is what they must do. And so let them, you know, have fun with it. Um, and then I would repeat that exercise in the left arm, starting from either the top or the very bottom. And again with finger three. And once they know where C is, they can find it pretty easily if you don't introduce another note. And then I make them do it with every one of the 10 fingers. All five fingers of your left hand, all five fingers of your, left, uh, of your right hand. And then you can play a game with them. Okay, I'm gonna say the finger number in the right hand and you have to hit a C with whatever finger number I say. You could choose whichever C it is, you know. So I say three, five, oops, I made a mistake, don't correct it, two, one, and so on. So that they're responding to an instruction, okay, finger number two, I have to play. If you lose, have to play C, I'm listening. And so that can go on for a while, as, as long or as little as you feel is appropriate, until they start to get a little bit bored with it, which might happen sooner for some and later for others, but whatever it is, you go at the student's pace, and then, we start looking at how to relax. Before we even start playing, we look how to stretch and relax before training, right? So I have some stretching exercises. A lot of times people will say, well, I have students with small hands and they can't reach this, they can't reach that, so they're not gonna play this piece and they won't even try. Actually, Chopin said that it's not a large hand that is great for piano, but a flexible hand. And when children are young, their joints, their bones, everything's growing, and they can be stretched in a healthy way without injury. So you can actually create a lot of flexibility in a hand that's not been trained yet, so that when the larger chord structures and octaves come, they will be ready for it. Um, so what I do is I develop the flexibility and the reach between each finger consecutively first. So I'll ask them to put the thumb on middle C and I'll say, well, what note can you reach while you're holding middle C down? Okay, well, I can do, you know, sometimes D, but usually I can do an octave. Okay. But usually the student, a small-handed student, might be able to only do five notes, sometimes six, but they can definitely do five, four or five. So let them go to where it starts to become like boom and they'll let you know well that doesn't feel good okay that's okay stay right where you are okay but try so let's say i'm like okay that's it holding those two notes down we want to stretch what not only the space between the thumb and the second finger but also the wrist so with the fingers holding the notes all the way down, then you ask them to do an up and down mo motion with the wrist, but not letting go of the note, that's crucial. And also, you ask them to make a circular counterclockwise motion with the wrist, and then a clockwise motion with the wrist, the whole time not letting go of the notes that are being held. Okay, I tend to time them. I say, let's do this motion for 15 seconds, then shake it out, then let's do the other one. 15 second intervals. And then I repeat the same thing with two and three, and then two and four, and two and five, and then three and four, and then three and five, and so on. So you're doing each hand separately to the point, maximum point of stretch, 
The rule is that the finger has to be at the bottom of the key and cannot let go of whatever interval it is. And then you do three sets of exercises, clockwise, counterclockwise, and vertical. And that really also warms up their hands. So if some students come in, oh, my hands are cold, oh, I have to warm up, whatever. Five minutes of that and your circulation's good, you're ready. You know, so a lot of times it's not just this we have to warm up, we have to warm up everything. So it's important that these things are talked about, I think, at the beginning. Uh, incidentally, I should have said earlier, these exercises that I'm showing you today, I spend anywhere between the first three to six months, okay, on these total exercises. Now, every child's different. And I'm not going to go into how I teach note reading and rhythm and all that because that's a separate thing. This is only just for their body and for their joints and their hands and the technical side of music. I do teach, you know, other stuff at that during these six months. Otherwise, they'd probably never come back. But I, I try to, I just for today, I want to stick with this. So I hope I, hope I made that clear. I forgot to say that at the beginning. Um, so then I say the five finger positions, right? Five finger positions are crucial because a lot of the exercises we're going to do next are related to how we use the five fingers in each hand. So I make them put the thumb on middle C, okay, for these next exercises. And then I put all five fingers, C, D, E, F, G. And then in the left hand, I'll start with the low C, the low middle C with finger five. So five finger position. And with that, we are now going to talk about the exercises to develop each joint. Well, I showed you the gravity drops. So once we have the fingers in these five, in, in five finger position, I make them do gravity drops, hands together, the same note in each hand with the pedal down. And I also teach them how to change the pedal. So I have them put, put their hands on the key. And then I have them lift and drop and hold. See, I missed. Don't correct. Remember, right? Lift, drop, and hold. Shake. Lift, drop, pick up your foot, put it back down. Shake. Be sure with this motion that there is no stopping the hand or the arm once it begins its lift. It should drop like that naturally. They miss, they miss. This is the problem. This is what will create tension, the effort to be accurate. So they'll get it. A lot of times they miss all of them. And then the next week they come, they're like, oh, it's not so bad, you know? Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, what they've learned to do is not to tighten the elbow, the wrist, or raise the shoulder when they're lifting, which is crucial. So then, once that's the largest joint, right? We're using pretty much our entire arm with our back supported and letting gravity go into the key. The next exercise, raise, throw, rest for the fingers. So I go from the biggest joints to the smallest. So now we just use the finger. I'm gonna demonstrate with the right hand. Each of these exercises, we do it in the right hand first, then we repeat the same thing in the left hand, and then we do it hands together, and then they move on to the next exercise, okay? So try to teach each hand separately first, and then together. Raise, throw, rest is kind of pretty basically what it sounds like. We're gonna raise the finger. We're going to do a gravity drop of sorts. I say throw because allowing one finger to be dropped by gravity is, you really can't feel that, that's pretty light. So we're going to add like a little bit of a throwing motion to help the speed of attack. And then rest. We're going to rest that finger on the key before we repeat the three steps with the next note. Okay? So with my hand in five finger position, raise, throw, rest. Raise, throw, rest. And I literally do it that slow. Most children are really impatient, but if you turn the hypnotic metronome on at 40 or 60 and say each motion is one or two ticks on the metronome, it'll calm them down. 
They get hypnotized. It's wonderful. So um, what you need to do is really make sure it's slow and make sure that the following rules are met. No finger, except the one we're working on, should leave the key. The hand should not leave the key. The elbow, shoulder, and back have to be in that nice position we worked on earlier. Okay. The fourth finger will not go up very high. That's okay. Don't force it, right? You tell them that and they always laugh. They're like, it doesn't go up. It's like, that's okay, neither does mine. Look, you know. The important thing is also that when they raise the finger that it's in that position. Don't allow them to do this because... How, is, how are you going to drop that? You're not dropping into the joint. So you're not associating the lift with the finger position and the attack with the finger position. Okay. So we do it in the left hand, then we do it hands together. Then we go on to two fingers at a time. So usually it takes a couple of weeks to get the single fingers doing it correctly. It's a lot... Um, quicker than you might think. It looks real hard, but it actually, a lot of kids respond to it really easily. This one's a little trickier. So you raise one and three, raise, drop, rest. Two fingers at a time. Raise, drop, rest. Raise, drop, rest. That one requires a little more patience, but if you've been patient with the first part, the single fingers, they're more apt to do this one more easily if they've already been trained with the single fingers. Okay, then we do the same thing, but we're now, we've exercised the fingers, these joints, we're gonna exercise the wrist next. That's the next biggest joint. So we're going to do push-ups with the wrist. So what that is, is when you attack the key, it's one note at a time, just like finger independence. Push the wrist up, hold the note down, and drop the wrist. Push the wrist up, hold the note down, drop the wrist. So we're not doing this. It's not a staccato articulation. It ends up actually being more connected, more legato, because when your wrist comes down, as you lift your wrist up for the next note, you're still holding the previous finger. So lift your wrist, drop your wrist. Lift your wrist, drop your wrist into the next finger. Okay. So that we do with single notes first, and then we do double notes, just like before. Like that, okay? So essentially we're training this joint next. Fingers always stay on the key, no fingers sticking up, ever. Only the fingers that are being used move. Okay, then the next joint. The legato with the elbow. Circular motion. So already they've gone from playing somewhat detached with the raised throw rest of the finger to somewhat legato with the drop and push up of the wrist. Okay. Now we're going to complete the legato sound. And legato comes from the arm, right? Finger legato is one thing, but it's not going to be as connected as if I add the wrist. But if I add the arm, it's the most connected, right? So legato is not a sound, it's a touch. It translates into a connected sound, but the actual word legato means binded or bound together or tied, like shoelaces or a marriage. <laughs> so you have to feel it that way. Two things that are in perfect union with each other, two things that are perfectly bound to each other. In this case, two sounds, that one sound is bound to another sound and comes from the previous one. And in order to do that, we use our raise, throw, rest position. We have our fingertips curved. At this point, we have some finger independence, right? So we're not using our fingers at all for this. This is use your elbow, and I usually equate it to a clock. I'm like, let's put the elbow down at six, 
and then go counterclockwise in the right hand, three, 12, nine, six, okay? So first one note, six, three, 12, nine, six. Once they can do that, I say, okay, at six o'clock, we're gonna add the D. Six, three, 12, does is it equates not only the same speed of attack with for each note but also when the note next note comes it's done from a complete sense of relaxation no picking up of the finger no stopping of any joint no tensing or tightening of anything in the arm wrist or fingers and listening to the decay rate right if Every piano is different. Everybody's musculature is different. So if the decay is happening too quickly on the note, tell them to go around the clock a little faster. But that will make them listen to how to relate one sound to another. And of course, like I say, then left hand, except left hand does it <laughs> clockwise. So we're going not counterclockwise. And then hands together. two notes, just like the other exercise. So these things are the basic foundations of, of piano technique, you know, just without training the fingers to go faster or be dexterous or speedy or strong. We're just identifying how to use our upper body in such a way that it creates a variety of sound and a variety of feeling according to what we're hearing. So we're relating physical approach and sound. Okay. Then, after that, there are basic touches. So already they're playing legato. Already they're kind of been introduced to staccato. Now we're gonna be more specific. So we take the five finger position and we create a pattern with it. So instead of just playing, exercise. Instead of playing the last C, I'm going to go up to the D and then the E and then all the way up until I get to the next C, until my thumb's on this octave C higher. So I use this five finger position and add on to it, make it longer, right? And this is when we start talking about legato versus staccato. Okay, they've just done the circular legato with the arm. So now we say, okay, we're going to play a strong tone, a full sound, and connect it legato to the next note with our arm weight. So remember the circular legato? Remember the little bit of gravity that comes in the downward stroke? the entire group, right? So instead of one revolution for each note, it's six, three, so it's six, three, twelve, nine, six, three, twelve, nine. You understand? So it's a circle for five notes. Um, and after that, hand staccato. We've already trained the wrist to do this, right? So now when we do the push-up, it becomes hand staccato meaning it's a wrist staccato, we don't stay on the note. Pick the hand up, rebound, and rest. Very important to tell the student that you're not making the sound with your finger. Your finger is supporting something else that's making the sound, which is the wrist. So the fingertip is firm and curved, it can accept the natural weight of the hand or the wrist. And that exercise is done. Okay, now you probably think, do we stay on five finger positions forever? No, of course not. The goal is to use all the piano and to make scales and to arpeggios and 
forwards and so on. But we can't do that until we discuss this guy, right? <laughs> so the thumb is a strange finger in many ways, obviously. The thumb can move in many directions. First of all, it's obvious it can move up and down in a vertical position. It can also move horizontally. It can also move clockwise or counterclockwise, right? But the thumb can also do this. That first joint of the thumb can move, right? It can't move in a circular motion, but it can move in an up and down motion. And a lot of times, this is why uh, students with smaller hands have trouble playing octaves, because this joint is not developed. And I'll just explain that later, but again, that's another lecture. But it's important to be aware of this movement as well, as this, as this, and this, and that. Okay. Unlike the other fingers, it actually is the most mobile finger. It can do so many different things. And it's important to introduce that. So what I like to do is I create a thumb exercise first to develop this, which a lot of, you know, a lot of us forget. Okay, so what I do is with the thumb curled inward and my hand in the normal position, Okay, I'll do it with the left hand. I think it's easier to see. Okay, so I'm open my thumb. When I close it, I'm going to grab the C and keep it closed. Then I'm gonna open it and flick it down to the next note. See? So I'm not lifting my hand, but I'm sort of wiggling my thumb and playing the note with a side joint movement, like that, okay? And it's important because before we do anything else, we wanna be aware of this. Once you can do that, you're already ahead of the game for the next exercise, passing the thumb under. So some people, you know, teach uh, arpeggios not connecting the thumb. As we go faster, that to a certain extent becomes the case. There will be maybe a slight lifting, you know, depending on the, the position of the hand, the piece you're playing, the speed of the arpeggio, yes. But the ideal is that it's connected, is that it's legato, right? Just like when we play scales, we don't want the thumb to create an unnecessary accent. We want it to have the same even sound as the other fingers. So what I do is I make a thumb exercise, I say, remember your five C, D, E, F, G. Okay, we're gonna add the A and the B and the next C, okay? And we're gonna use pairs of fingers. Here we go, one and two. And then back down. Again, I'll show it in the left hand. exercise with one and three up and down one and four and also very importantly one and five actually with one and five it's the best sound because the thumb is so restricted in its movement that it actually makes a gentle sound and have them listen to how that sounds even though it's rare to connect the pinky and the thumb. We do it sometimes in some ways, but it's the best sounding one. It's the most even. If you try it at home, it's, it's it, well, we're all at home, aren't we? Um, anyway, try it. <laughs> um, so that is really important to do before you introduce any kind of finger exercises or any kind of scale, because there has to be the control. So in this case, we've done legato, we've done staccato, we've exercised our thumb, our fingertips are curved, we've understood the relaxation throughout the body that's necessary, and then you're off to the races. I says introduction to resource materials. Now, that can be whatever you're comfortable with. 
I like to use Hannon. I like to use Cherny. Uh, for Cherny, I use um, the 599 and the 100 progressive exercises, and also, uh, I forget what it's called, the beginning piano, uh, exercises for beginners. It's, there's three opus, um, and they're all published by Shermer, available on Amazon and very cheap. So it's, it's very good. <laughs> um, and, and all those exercises, okay, I make sure that I'm following through with all the exercises and articulations I've introduced so far. So they know how to play staccato. They know what I mean when I say use your wrist. They know what I mean when I say use arm legato. They, you understand, they know what I mean when I say tuck the thumb under him, stay legato. And I follow, the good thing about the churny especially, Hannon is just sheer repetition. That's good for developing stamina um, and strength. But churning is good because he adds all the fingering in there. And the fingering is based on the same fingering that was used by Beethoven and Liszt and everyone else. You know, So you're getting an introduction to how important fingering is for creating a certain sound. And you pair that with how important using the body is to create a certain sound. They work together. So it's not all about the fingering and it's not all about the body. It's about how you apply everything to make this hear what you want to hear. I'm uh, sorry, there's a question on the chat that you might want to. Oh, um, I, yeah. Uh, let me just see. The face uh, throw. Uh, let's see. Do you do the thumb exercises with scales other than C major, A minor, scales that use black keys? Absolutely. So um, when I'm doing these exercises, okay, I'm showing you this um, white keys only just for a basic, uh, that's a great question. I should have clarified that. Just for the basic idea of how to use the fingers. So when I teach the five finger exercise, I also do, um, teaching them pentatonic positions in every key. So, for example, you know, we do it by uh, full step, full step, half step, full step, right? Um, and then I make them find the same whole step, half step pattern on any key, and pretty soon, you know, they're playing all the major pentascales, right? Um, and then you introduce the minor ones just by lowering the third note and so on. So yes, it's, it's really valuable to do it on the black keys as well. And don't be afraid of the thumb on the black key. Of course, we don't do it in scales, but it's okay. The thumb is going to end up on the black key quite a lot of the time when they play harder pieces. So uh, is there another um, question? No, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I've got a question on the raise throw lift. Yes. It looks like one time, this is Stephanie, by the way, I it looks like one time you were, you were, you play and then raise and down, but then other times it looked like down was playing and raising was getting toward the next note. Uh, so I'm a little confused where the raise goes. Okay. So in the raise throw rest, it would be the same if you're doing it with the finger or two fingers together or the wrist. So it's raise, and then you stay raised in that position. Relaxed, but stay raised. And then you throw, is throw what makes the sound. And the rest actually translates to when you make the sound, you don't hold the sound. You just let it drop. And then naturally the finger will rebound because the key pushes the finger back up. I think this was the one before that, the bigger motion, raise throw, uh, sorry. Um, beep, 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 beep. What? Maybe it was the gravity. I don't know. It just seemed like one time it was, it was one that you took to legato. I think that may have been it. I'm sorry. Yeah. It was the wrist, it was the wrist push ups. Yes, it was. That may have been it. Yeah. So, Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Thanks for clarifying that. So. For the wrist push-ups, that's under the exercises to, to develop each joint. The, the wrist push-up was just, with your fingers on the five notes, push the wrist up. Basically, what happens if your wrist pushes up, your finger goes down into the note. 
and then it stays in the note, right? And then you rest, but your finger stays in the bottom of the key. Okay, thanks. That makes sense. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So the pentascales in chromaticism we got onto. I'm glad someone asked that because that's kind of uh, the next part where where you see like exercises to develop independence of the fingers. That's like a, a kind of graduated version of what we've been doing so far. So the next level. And that's why here is where you introduce the pentascales, the major and minor. And it says, uh, but before that, I there's one other thing I just wanted to put, show you is the hold one play four exercise. That's an important one. And again, it looks quite hard and students sometimes get frustrated, but they almost 99.9 .9 come back the next week and they're so proud that they can do it but it's not something that happens easily right away so it's hold the thumb down you take turns holding down a finger hold the thumb down with the weight of the hand and lift and articulate the other four fingers in an up and down direction four times in a row up and down that's fine the next finger I make them do is the pinky because it's equally easy. <laughs> so hold the pinky down, start with the lowest finger, go up and down, right? Then I ask them to do finger two. That's the next easiest. Hold two down. One, three, four, five, four, three, one, three. And then four is actually sometimes easier than three, believe it or not. Four. Hold it down, and it's okay if the finger comes up. It's totally okay. You can ask them to help with the other hand if the finger comes down, and you can ask them to repeat between the held finger if they're having trouble. They'll get it. It's a real, um, it's like a tongue twister, you know, or a puzzle. They have to really feel it. They have to feel the process and until the mind it's really more about the mind than the hand at all it's more about telling the finger what to do and then three holds down and then you articulate the fingers around the three now you have to make sure that the fingers that are moving and playing are playing smoothly with the legato touch but you'll notice the difference between like an arm legato to create the sound and figure legato in this case is that my arm was stationary because I'm using the weight of the arm not to make the legato, but to hold the stationary note down without tension. If they're pressing and holding, it's tight. But if they allow gravity, right? Gravity drop, natural weight, race, and through, put the finger down on the moving notes, right? That's why I either hold them here or hold the finger down, whatever works better and make sure that everything is loose, the joints we talked about. So pentascales and chromaticism, that's introducing the 12 major and minor pentascales, and I use different touches. So what I'll ask the student, once they know all, all the pentascales, right? I'll say, okay, you're gonna start the pattern, which is this pattern, I'll play it quickly so that you understand what I'm doing. Make it minor. metronome so they can't hesitate one note per beat whatever speed you like fast or slow I start slow and I call out varying touches as they're playing the exercise so I say okay let's start with arm circles their speed sharpens their response the brain's response to telling the finger what to do which inevitably is the foundation for all finger articulation and independence we have to be connected so that's something that you can be creative with and I put introduction to resource materials there because 
Pishna is a very good um, technical exercise. I don't know if some of you use Pishna already, maybe. Some of you probably use all this stuff already. And you can use anything you like, but the reason why I enjoy Pishna is because it's based on chromatic progressions. So what we've introduced here is used, like Hannon is based on all white notes, so I use it earlier. Pishna is based on chromaticism, so I use it now. Um, so after that, we have the scale technique, the thumb exercise with an octave scale. So what, it's a further development of what we did earlier with the one, two, one, two, and then one, three, one, three. Okay, so now I introduce the fingering for the scales, which is, let's, let's take C major or G major, whatever, the three and then the thumb goes after the three and we go to the five and afterwards the finger three crosses over the thumb. Okay, so I make them play the thumb and then silently depress the next two notes, hold them, put the thumb under, play the thumb, and then silently depress the other four notes while they're holding the thumb. Then I make them release that, and then I make them hold that thumb and play the next two notes silently, and then play the thumb. And then I do the reverse. The thumb goes down silently, holds, the other two fingers play with sound, Thumb passes under, holds down silently, all the other notes play together. Now what that does is it teaches them control over the passing of the thumb with a stationary hand, so we don't get this, right? And it teaches them to really focus on the speed of the attack in the thumb, right? So that this joint doesn't start playing the thumb. We want the thumb to be played with the thumb and not some other part of the body. So that technique, creating like an exercise to develop the finest control first in a slow tempo is, is the best. And then we move forward with playing the scale normally. I never make them play it loud. I make them play it piano so they can listen and um, Presumably at this point, they understand that, that the thumb has to move a certain way and that there's nothing extra that's creating bumps or lumps or whatever. Um, so that's, that's uh, it's very important to do that before. Um, and then I use whatever scale book. Hannon has the scales with very good fingering. It's exercise 39, I'm sure. You all have, there's, there's the music development program. There's, I mean, everybody and their mom has a scale book out there. So whatever works well for you guys is, is what you should use. Um, so they're under resources. So this is kind of dated. I guess I should update it. It's not called, in Canada, it's still called Royal Conservatory, right, Chris? Yeah, but here it's called, is it still music development program or? I think they finally decided, let's just call it the Royal Conservatory okay. everywhere. Okay, that's what I, I knew that something happened, but I wasn't sure. About 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah, so like they have really good, um, what I like about them is they have, like they have the grades obviously, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. Um, the, the scales are selected, you know, just a, a grouping of them. So it's not overwhelming, which is really great for a lot of students. Then they have like one complete scale book. It used to be the red book. I don't know if it's still red. It used to be brown a while ago, <laughs> too, but whatever color it is now, it's got all the scale fingers, and they're very good. And um, so it's very clear also, so that you, know, you can use that. Um, and the last thing I want to talk about is this quarto, the rational principles of pianoforte technique. So with this lecture today, it's a combination of many things, okay? It's a combination of learning from all of you, in doing all these lectures over the years to different groups of teachers, learning from my mentors and teachers that have inspired me, learning from my own students, which I have to be better and more succinct in what I say, and 
you know, these resources. So it's kind of a combination. So what Quarto provides is a very, very intellectually complicated version of what I just showed you. <laughs> it's, it's really a difficult read. It's wonderful. And I use his um, annotated edition for Chopin Etudes and so on and so forth because he was amazing the way he described certain things. That the, uh, the language is very florid 19th century French, British you know, type of, it, it, it's almost poetry. You really have to think about it, but, but it's interesting. It, it's a great book uh, and it discusses a lot of these things. Some of those silently depressing the notes while the thumb passes, that's from Courteau's book. So at this point, I just want to say, are there any questions or are there any comments or can someone would like to share something about their experiences with uh, teaching young beginners in this way? I actually might just ask, Sasha, you mentioned the Royal Conservatory. Do you use that ordering of scales and such uh, in the syllabus or do you do something more like chromatic based or circle of fifths or? So what I did when I was actually uh, teaching, I taught in Canada for several years and I sent the kids to the exams. Then I would, I would always teach all the scales, but then I would zero in on the ones that they required for that level for the exam. But I kind of like doing it because in the same way that you teach the pentascales, it's pretty good, pretty good to kind of teach all the scales and all the keys right away. I think if they can handle it, why not? And you also find the ordering of when they introduce, I find it works well, like for when to add in oh, note chords, for example. And Yep, because they introduce things in a very progressive way as far as like fingering patterns and, and you know, different keys have different fingerings. So not to overwhelm a student with too many different things right away and to really secure what they've already learned before adding something different. So I think it's really effective that way. Um, I have a question. Yes. <laughs> On the exercise for um, hold one, play four, how, what is your technique for making sure that there's no stress on that finger that's being held? Right. That's a great question. So a lot of times, you know, while they're playing it, so like I said before, let's say we're working on finger three or something. And you make sure, okay, before they start to play or if they have started to play and they're really locking up, you know, and you see it on their face and they're upset and everything, and then you try, you try to just kind of tap all your tension points. Okay, let's tap joint one. Let's see how he's doing, you know, and then two, three. Let's see if I can move your wrist while you're holding that third finger down. Let's see if we can make an arm circle while you're holding that three down, you know, and then why don't you just play one note? And let's see if you're still loose. So like being kind of reintroducing all the tension spots. That's why I call them tension spots, right? From the top. Oh, oh yeah. great. Thank you. That definitely answers that question. Thank oh, you. Good. Good. I'm sorry. I think I talked for five minutes too long. I didn't leave enough time for questions. That's okay. <laughs> Thank there's you. One, there's one in the chat. There is one more. Yes, uh, let me look. How do you prevent boredom with these exercises? That's a great question. <laughs> do you work on pieces or games for little ones? Yes, and and that goes back to you know what I said earlier. I, I hope I made it clear. I, by no means is this all I do with them for the first three or six months because they probably never come back. <laughs> They'd be bored to death. Um, but I do, I do add, we're at, you know, also we're, we're reading notes, we're singing, we're learning fun stuff, and I try not to overwhelm. So one thing I will say with that is um, two times a week, I like to see the beginners more frequently than not. If they can afford two half hour lessons, then even 15 minutes twice a week or 20 minutes, it's better than just once a week. I find if they can do it, if it works. Of course, now with Zoom, it's amazing. <laughs> you know, I, I teach entirely online. I, I can't. I, I'm not able to have people in the house for uh, a medical reason. So I have to be careful. But I found that students that come to lessons and are so unresponsive have turned into the students I always wanted them to be. Oh, my. It, it's amazing. And I've, I've had, you know, situations the other way around, too, where some kids have 
done worse, you know, because they haven't been able to get out of the house or come for a live lesson. But it's amazing how, how people learn, you know, and what they respond to. Something else I learned recently. Never would have thought that would happen, ever. Mm -hmm. Sasha, thank you so much. Thank you so much for this wonderful session we've had. And we um, are going to take a break now. And so thank you so much. Let's... <laughs> thank you very much for having me again. I'm looking forward to the, seeing you again this afternoon. Yes. OK, and we're going to go straight to Tammy, who is going to do another basket drawing. Who's in the pumpkin?